application process. This is the third webinar in this series in year two. So the final one for year two, there were three in year one and we'll be coming back for more in year three on some different topics. So the, the people you'll be hearing from today are Janine Small and um, Stéphane Bone and the other members of the team who are here, but uh, in the listening role today are Judith uh, Desjardins and José Landriot. José is presenting later for the French and you would have met Judith if you attended a previous webinar and she'll chime in at different times uh, where appropriate and be contributing to the conversations. We strongly encourage you to contribute your comments, thoughts, questions through the chat. Again, attendees and panelists or through the Q&A option. If you would like to activate the closed captioning option that is there for you to do so, um, please um, do that. If the difference, when you click on that, you have a few options. The subtitles will just scroll across the bottom of the screen. If you choose the uh, transcription option, then it will pop open a window on the right where you'll see a transcription, which is very similar. The difference is that you are able to see the name of who is speaking. So um, we wish everyone a, a great hour of learning together. And as usual, the recording and resources will be sent afterward. And we'll be back, Luciana and myself, at the end of the webinar for a few final words. Um, a special so hello to Blaine, president of CPCO. Glad to have you join us today as well, Blaine. And I think Janine and Stefan, we are turning it over to you. Great. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, um, from our three association, ADFO, CPO, and, o and OPC. Um, as Nadine mentioned, this is a series, a collaborative project uh, between the three association. This is the third and final webinar uh, for this year, uh, year two. And this webinar explores our leaders' role in maximizing the impact of caring and safe school policies and procedures for students with autism working through a transdisciplinary approach. Uh, in webinar two, we talked in detail about a transdisciplinary approach, and we'll also briefly recap throughout our slide deck, but essentially, who is your support team? Um, and as we work through the webinar today, I want you to consider who is currently on your interdisciplinary team, and is there an opportunity to, to expand the team to include the various perspectives and support of students with autism, and of course, our students with special education needs. So as uh, I acknowledge that we are all gathered here today from across the province on um and the land acknowledgements may differ depending on where you are situated uh, through OPC and in, uh, I'm going to read the land acknowledgement uh, for Toronto. So I acknowledge that I'm on traditional ter territory of the nations within nations, including the Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, and the Mishisagi. This land has been and continues to be home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I would like to acknowledge the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples on the lands of which we all gather here today across Ontario and thank the past, present and future caretakers of this land. I am grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn on these lands in the community of Sharon. As users of the land, we must continue to work to keep it clean and use it with care so that generations to come can also benefit from the land. Thank you. All of our webinars are linked to the Ontario Leadership Framework. Today's webinar um, will support principals and vice principals improving the instructional program. So to ensure best possible learning experience as we engage in the professional learning this webinar today, please do allow for at least 45 minutes of your time. And as Nadine had mentioned earlier in the beginning, please do uh, take opportunity to um, put questions and stuff that you may have in the chat, okay? So who are our audience here today? It's gonna to take a minute just for you to answer a polling question to help us get to know who the audience is by uh, answering a few questions for us, please. Okay. 
Sorry, I don't know if the result will come up after or if it's closed, please just let me know. And Janine, just jumping in here, if you're having trouble hitting submit, it might be that you haven't answered all the questions. Please use the scroll bar on the right side of the poll to make sure you get down to the bottom. Wonderful. Okay, so we've got quite a few elementary folks here with us today and administrators or principals. Um, great. And how many years? Okay. So thank you. At least we know who is here today and we welcome everyone again for being here. As we move through um, here, we have taken information resources from our ministry's document here. It's from 2014, Equity and Inclusive Education in Ontario Schools. Um, this particular document does aim to help us to understand, identify and address and eliminate barriers, as well as power dynamics um, that limit students' prospects and learning. It is also provides guidelines for school boards um, in their work toward developing policies and strategies towards equitably inclusive schools. Um, there are practical strategies involved in this particular uh, resource, along with examples and templates for you to, to look to as well as, uh, as a guide. Okay. Um, one of the, another resources that we have looked as well is, you know, I know Ministry Secretary is at one point we released or they released a capacity building series and there was a series on culturally responsive relevant pedagogy. Um, this is drawn from the work of Gloria Billen Lanston, uh, sorry, <laughs> Gloria Lanston Billen rather, uh, which teaches allow for integration of the students background lived experiences um, in to be integrated in the curriculum, but also the teaching and learning experience in the classroom. So this is really um, a, a go-to document is still relevant as we work through um, resources shared with you today. So as leaders, you know, school principals um, and vice principals, you have an influential role in fostering and welcoming supportive classroom school environments. So you, as leaders, you're going to be creating conditions for safe and caring schools for students with autism. So how can principal foster that inclusive and um, inclusive schools for students with special education needs? Well, relationships are found are fundamental to building um, that collaborative approach. Communication uh, is key right, in terms of your leadership skills and who are you communicating with, as well as your uh, principals model the behavior that you would like to see. So you are key and influential in those particular role. So in that sense, what are the conditions necessary for students with special education needs as you think about your role as influential and setting those conditions for students? So what we would like to do is through a case study, we would like to go through this webinar using a case study. And through this particular case study, we're going to explore how yourself as leaders can create conditions for safe and caring schools for students with autism. And in this particular case study, again, if there's questions or comments, you please do use the chat. So a student, I'll read the case for you, just some highlighted piece around the screen. A student with a diagnosis of autism uh, and LD learning disability. In the last five weeks, student has demonstrated physical aggression in behaviors such as spitting, kicking, um, and state in verbal, uh, verbal slurs that are culturally and racially insensitive. Teachers report that the student is trash in the classroom uh, and they believe that the aggression has no triggers. Currently, student only attends school until 1 p.m. Student demonstrate high interest in World War II, country origins and flags. Although the student has many interests, teachers state that it's hard to program for them. The teaching team reports numerous violent incident reports and one support staff has taken a stress leave. The administration has called 911 on two occasions at school where parents ended up uh, taking the student home. Parents are frustrated and student is, uh, that student is demonstrating such extreme behaviors only at school. The team is expressing burnout, but continue to gather substantial behavior data and are eager to try strategies that may help the situation. 
So in this particular, we have a complex case with a variety of noted concerns. How do we ensure prevention and intervention strategies and tools that consider the safety of all students, right? So we need to consider perhaps um, staff professional learning, explicit teaching of skills, and of course, our transdisciplinary approach, which we which we will talk uh, recap again. So in order to support the student, there are some key considerations that we need to keep in mind. So access to central resources or targeted professional learning. I know in many boards, uh, there is a position of of board certified behavior analysts, BCBAs, that could be used as resources. Um, we need to make sure that how are we determining the function of the behavior? So perhaps a F, uh, FBA, functional behavior um, and analysis can be done, uh, behavior intervention plan or crisis management, and as well as providing uh, you know, tools for that particular student. And in those tools, something that we could use further, we'll talk about in terms of the IEP. So cases like this does require the collaboration um, between the family, the school, and the many different professionals there at the school, perhaps a community agency, or as well as for uh, medical um, teams that may be involved with this particular student. Again, each student cases may, may differ. It is important to know that these agencies, um, who they are in advance, um, so that perhaps if there are um, consent that need to be completed, two-way consent, and that's done uh, prior because you have that information about the student. So you need to also consider uh, the facilitation of safe school integration for this particular student or um, students in general to ensure that the staff understand the strategies to support the students in effective ways. Okay. Now, this, when we talk about cultural uh, practice, as we know, we need to be able to get to know students. And as we know students, there are many different um, students are diverse in their needs and diverse in their cultural ba background. And we really want to, as we look at that particular monograph that we shared earlier, culturally responses and relevant, relevant pedagogy. That also involves around, again, when we talk about our, the, the communities for which, who are the people, what who are the people that are in this particular community that we need to cer certainly have an understanding of the students and their background. So in terms of um, example would be an assessment, right? How, what assessments are being used? And is that, is, is that assessment culturally relevant to that particular student? There is also um, in, in terms of the curriculum itself, is it engaging for that particular student? Um, those are things that I think we, we, we do need to consider. And in these uh, as the key piece here is to help understand how do we respond to the students. So we need to make sure that there is a variety of resources, uh, community partners, learning environment, pedagogy in terms of the materials and the resources that we use in order to support uh, students in every way possible. Um, those are just things that we need to consider as we go forward. I don't know, Stefan, if you want to add anything there. Thank you, Jenny. I think it's really important that uh, cultural practice is uh, really a new phenomenon in both uh, education and also in clinical work. We're realizing that a lot of tools that are being used were never uh, really uh, tested on specific populations. So the outcome could lead to misdiagnosis and also not taking into consideration the full family history and the values and beliefs are also, especially in autism, uh, because there is some different perception about the needs, about the diagnosis itself, and also what would be the best approach to use with these students. Thank you for that, Stefan. Um, so as we, as we look ahead, and we think about, you know, it is a must that the learning conditions are set for students, right? Students who are identified as having special education needs, they behaviors, behavior first is a form of communication. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, and through behavior, students express a variety of needs, right? So you've got their communication needs, social, emotional, academic, or physical. And through these needs, um, there are conditions that may affect that. So communication disorders is identified by the DSM-5. Toxic could be language, autism is under there. Um, executive functioning skills, we're talking about skills that may include working memory, skills that may include flexibility in thinking, um, that may be a condition, as well as, you know, uh, self-control. 
and of course, mental health um, concerns. So these are things that we need to certainly keep in mind as we think about um, students and what those conditions for learning may be based on some of the behaviors that may be, uh, that students may be displaying. So what are the conditions for learning? In this particular diagram, so understanding the needs of students with autism, um, and again, for all students with special education, uh, the root cause of the behavior will help us as educators to prevent, in terms of prevention and intervention uh, measures, most likely to address the behaviors effectively. Um, and also uh, resources, what resources that will most likely um, provide the student with constructive as um, ongoing support. So when you look at this particular diagram in this image, we look at what are, what are the surrounding um, things that need to be put in place. So we need to consider the environment for sure. Um, and what are some of those root causes to sort of help, uh, the, help the students um, learn in various ways. So as I, as I look at the case study, and this is just a little piece of the, the case, uh, we think about the, you know, the student demonstrated high interest in World War II, country wars, and et cetera. Um, although the student has many interests, teachers say it's hard to program for them. So from webinar one, um, understanding the student with autism, in this case, the student in this case study, what are the strengths of this student and what are explicit skills that need to be taught? Um, what professional learning do staff need in order to support that student? So in, you know, what would we expect to see in the students uh, with regards to the student's IEP? What are some of the programming? What are the strengths? What are the areas for growth? As well as how can the IEP be used to really support this? So in developing in, in asking those questions to support the students, and then we come back to as well as well, who are, what is the, who are on your transdisciplinary team um, to sort of help. And that now we bring in webinar two, which actually looks at, you know, who's our support people. So who are the folks that you would reach out to in these particular cases and who's on your team to consider as we move forward in that, okay? So understanding uh, the behaviors, um, Behaviors, again, is a behavior is a form of communication. And there are different, they, in order to help us understand the behavior, we need to keep in mind that what the behaviors do occur in context. Um, behaviors is learnt as well as they serve as, as a function, right? So is it escape? Is it centric? What is the function of the behavior? And that is really important for us to really get to um, and understand that. So reference in terms of being proactive, um, we want to make sure that we are being proactive in dealing with and addressing some of the behaviors. So I'll pass it to uh, Stefan and he will go a bit further into talking about um, some of the behaviors. Thank you, Janine. I think what's also what Janine just mentioned, and, and I wanna also put some emphasis, when we talk about behaviors, especially with the autistic population, we need to differentiate between behaviors that are directly associated with the child's personality, behaviors that are uh, based on symptoms, meaning the autistic traits, and behaviors that were learned because starting from home, uh, some uh, behaviors might be, uh, you know, learned, uh, which does not uh, transfer itself in the school setting. So if you go back to the uh, case study, we strongly realize that this uh, student, there is some miscommunication and different perception and also different understanding of the behaviors, which don't generalize. And so there won't be any maintenance of the behaviors within the school environment. So each time you see uh, extreme violent behaviors, that means somewhere, somehow, somebody tried to, do, to intervene, somebody tried to put something in place. So they're trying to work on the behavior, but the reality of it is we need to differentiate between what is a neurodevelopmental disorder. So the biological component of autism means that some of the autistic traits, the child each time, if he has no skills or hasn't learned the appropriate skills, he's gonna always go back to the autistic traits to compensate. So that means then by association, he will really have developed a sequence of action 
And that's where you see violent behaviors. And that's where you see a lot of people say, well, I know I just tried to intervene. There was no trigger. When we talk about antecedent, antecedent is also when we know within a certain environment or based on task or based on individuals that they are triggering some behaviors. When we're talking also about when we can't identify a trigger, often it's mostly based on the uh, inability for that child to self-regulate. So autistic individual will use uh, compensating behaviors to self-regulate. Either you'll see it behaviorally, either you'll see it emotionally, but for sure you'll see it cognitively. This case study, there's a dual diagnosis. So what are the behaviors that are really, uh, you know, the impact of being autistic versus having a learning disability versus having personality traits because this this kid at home is having he's taking control over the situation has never been told no has never learned you know uh, pro social and social cognition meaning the ability to adapt to modulate within the environment so what you see as the behavior and i think this is where you need to watch as a school principal or vice principal don't get all the team to be about behaviors because it's not going to be helpful they, they are limited to when it comes to cognitive development. They're also limited. We need people with good uh, you know, knowledge, with pedagogy, explicit teaching and everything. So your team should be based on that. And that's where transdisciplinary kicks in because you start with the family and the child and build around that you know, family based on uh, you know, cultural understanding. We should always have somebody, like I, I've been in the field for 25 years now, and I've been exposed to different culture where they have different understanding of what autism is. And that itself creates major chaos because people think that you can just, you know, change a diagnosis or that autism will disappear at one point. So that's where uh, we need to start thinking differently about behavior which re with regards to autism. You can switch. Uh, so in webinar one, we did talk about executive functioning. And, and, and again, I need to go back a bit. If a child with autism, just like any child with any di diagnosis, if they uh, don't have good self-regulation skills, meaning if they can't control their behavior, if they can't control their emotional reaction, uh, that will have a direct impact on executive functioning. So when people say, well, I'm working on executive functioning, or did you do the previous work where did you work on self-regulation? Is this kid being able to, by himself, independently, can they monitor their own behavior? Can they monitor their emotional response to the environment, to a task, to anything? If you say no, or if you say yes with somebody beside them, then for sure the executive functioning are not there and that's going to have a major impact on the cognitive engagement of any child but specifically with with autism so all about cognitive challenges really is about emotional regulation in autism and also this is where inhibition is different than impulsivity impulsivity is when you've learned a sequence of behaviors inhibition is when a child is capable because we taught him new sequence, new ways of uh, acting out so they can stop themselves and think before uh, you know, doing something. When we talk about impulsivity, it's kids that are learned behaviors. So each time they are in the environment, they will automatically, based on any stimuli, respond impulsively. So there's no thinking about it. It's just an automatic response to a learned sequence of behavior inhibition. It's more you're teaching that child or that student to really how do they stop themselves and look at options. So when you're teaching replacement behavior or alternative behavior, what you're really trying to say is by giving this opportunity to the student that he'll be capable of stopping themselves and really do an observation of what's happening around and then adapt, be flexible, and then take initiative based on it. So that's where you start talking about executive functioning with the world of autism. You can switch it. Sorry, there you go. Is that me? Uh, I think so, I'm not sure. I can talk more. 
Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Uh, so again, you know what? What it the 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 beauty of transdisciplinary team? It's also to be looking at yes, the child, the environment, the child with regards to other students, the child's relationship with the adult, and also how can we look at the environment and really start looking at what is being used and use it uh, in a constructive way. Uh, you know, you Google autism, everybody's going to talk about using visual. But if you don't use visual in, in, with, within the pedagogy, meaning explicit teaching, like using visual to guide a student with the task and, and really chunking the information, that's different than using a visual just to as a signal to refer the child to an action. And I think some people tend to feed on the autistic traits because they're not using the stool appropriately. So having structure means also uh, making sure that there is changes within the day, that it's not always routine because anytime that you feed the routine, that means kids are not thinking. It becomes an habituation. It's automatic response and they'll react differently and you know resisting any forms of change so we should be always in the environment providing opportunities for these kids to be structured but not having the same thing at the same moment so because we need to work anticipation with autism if people that are working in the field of autism are not putting a lot of work in anticipation then we're not helping these autistic students to become independent anticipation is one of the key factor that really uh, interferes in autistic children's uh, ability to learn. So uh, all these moments and really change. So the, having tools is good, but it's having the right element to be able to use these tools with them. Thank you, Stefan. If I can also add in terms of the environment, it's not just the classroom environment, but the school environment, the structure in terms of where the classrooms may be located. I know that there are some, stu some students with autism may have sensory need. And if the classroom perhaps might be situated beside um, the you know, washroom, they can hear the fan of the washroom whenever students, like it's just really being mindful as Stefan says around the various, um, being anticipating some of the needs, knowing the student and to be able to structure the environment, whether that's the whole school environment or the classroom environment for that particular student. Okay. Um, so in looking at the case study, it talks about in the last five weeks, the student has demonstrated physical aggression and behaviors such as spitting, kicking, and stating verbal, uh, verbal slurs that are culturally and racially insensitive. So when we think about this and in moving and thinking about the environment, so how is the learning environment in the classroom um, and again in the school arranged? So what does that environment look like for yourself? Thanks for you to consider. And again, like we've stated before, not just the physical um, classroom environment, but what makes up the learning environment. So resources that are also being used in that teaching uh, learning moment as well. Um, so those are just things that we want you to think about as we go through this particular uh, case. Okay. Now, the next few slides um, are, is or are presented by two presenters, Colin Fleming uh, from OPC, as well as Jeff Batchelor, um, support uh, from uh, CPCO. And um, I'm going to play the slides as we go through. So again, if you have any questions, you can put them in the uh, chat or comments. When appropriate student behavior occurs involving any student, but in particular, when we consider students with special needs, we need to consider a range of options in response to the behavior, keeping in mind a progressive discipline approach. Examples of progressive discipline would include having discussions with the teacher, restorative justice conversations, contacting the parents, guardians, speaking to them, uh, seeking input as to what they may be able to offer. And the Ministry of Education has a variety of docu documents around progressive discipline. A couple of these include one entitled Progressive Discipline, part of Ontario's approach to making schools safe places to learn, and a second one entitled Supporting Bias-Free Progressive Discipline in Schools. The consequences should also include learning opportunities because we need to help students not only realize what they shouldn't do, but also help them make good decisions as to what they should do and when they should do it. 
you need to consider the related ministry documents and always consult your board's policies and procedures and with your supervisory officer when considering a suspension or some other form of discipline. The two main forms of disciplinary measures with which school leaders are familiar are suspensions and expulsions. A suspension means that students are removed from the school temporarily for a specific period of time up to 20 days. It's important to focus on the language that precedes each of the relevant sections of the Education Act, subsection 306 and subsection 310. For suspensions, subsection 306, a principal shall consider whether to suspend a pupil at all. Whereas for expulsions, section 310, a principal shall suspend a pupil. And then after an investigation, the principal recommends to the board whether or not a student should be expelled from school only or from all schools. It's important to note that only the school board can make the decision to expel a student. Please remember there is no such thing as an informal suspension. Following the July 2020 announcement of Ontario's action plan to address systemic racism in schools, the ministry has created new regulations that change how student behavior is addressed in junior kindergarten to grade three. As a result, suspensions are removed as a discretionary measure for students in these levels. Consult the Education Act, Ministry resources, and your school district's policy documents for more information on expulsions. And remember, these should be done in consultation with the Superintendent of Education. When considering what form of discipline to take, the principal needs to take into account a variety of mitigating and other factors. These factors must be considered while accommodations and supports are in place and prior to making a decision as to whether to suspend or not. These mitigating factors would include the, people, the pupil does not have the ability to control his or her behavior, does not have the ability to understand the foreseeable consequences of his or her behavior, and the pupil's continuing presence in the school does not create an unacceptable risk to the safety of any other person. In addition to the mitigating factors to which Jeff referred, there are also other factors that a school leader must consider. Particularly for our purposes, other factors in the case of a pupil for whom an individual education plan has been developed may include those on your screen, whether the behavior was a manifestation of the disability, whether appropriate individualized accommodation has been provided, and whether the suspension or expulsion is likely to result in an aggravation or worsening of the pupil's behavior or conduct. But further to those, and since 2012, there are also a number of other factors that include the history of the student, whether progressive discipline approaches have been contemplated and used, whether the student's behavior may be related to that student having been harassed in some way, whether the student's suspension or expulsion would affect his or her ongoing education, and of course, the age of the student. The concept of exclusion is also a strategy the principal can consider to deal with inappropriate behavior. An exclusion is subject to an appeal to the board and allows the principal to refuse to admit to the school or classroom a person whose presence in the school or classroom would be in the principal's judgment be de detrimental to the physical or mental well-being of the pupils. 
and this can be found in the Education Act, Section 265M. We must emphasize at this point that exclusions are not intended as a form of discipline. They are usually only appropriate as short-term measures and their purpose is to ensure that appropriate resources are put in place to support the student's successful return to school as well as to ensure the safety of the student in question and that of all other students in the building. Exclusion is a more appropriate option than suspension or expulsion when a student's behavior may not be considered culpable. That is likely to be the case with the students we are discussing today, where mitigating and other factors would be considered and applied accordingly. An exclusion should be considered in consultation with a superintendent of education, as exclusions are subject to an appeal to the entire board of trustees. If you have any questions about student discipline pertaining to suspensions, expulsions, exclusions, or any other form of discipline or related measure, reach out to your protective services team for advice and support. Great, so in, in hearing the context in terms of uh, discipline, and as we move forward and thinking about the case study in this particular case and our students with autism is, what does your disciplinary um, or suspension data tells you? Because we do look at data to help us, to guide us and to plan going forward. So how many suspensions have you had to date? I know that we are in at uh, different times um, in terms of COVID, but nonetheless, thinking about uh, prior, how many of those were students with special education needs? And again, how many of those with special education needs were specifically related to students with autism? And is there a pattern? Because that's something that we want you to think about, think about your data. And again, in, in terms of equity and anti-oppression and thinking about your data that way, well, who are, like when we ask who are the students, are you thinking about um, the, the diversity of your students and the makeup of those students? And what does that what does the data tell you? Um, so in thinking about your data, again, what are your current practices? Um, are you thinking that needs to be perhaps reviewed, um, revised, or implemented? What is your progressive discipline policy at your school uh, in light of the new ministry um, PPM that came out? Uh, is there a pattern in terms of a primary students being um, suspended versus um, you know, upper elementary or in secondary, what are the grades per se? Um, so these are things that we want you to, to think about. Um, have you considered, how have you again considered mitigating and other factors in response to inappropriate behaviors and all interactions with students with autism considering that, you know, continue, they're on a continuum, but what is your continuum of uh, progressive discipline considering the needs? And this is where we hope you rely on your, um, uh, sorry, I hope you rely more so on your transdisciplinary approach as we move and go forward. Okay. In terms of the case study, so parents are frustrated that the student is demonstrating such extreme behaviors only at school. Uh, the school team is expressing burnout, but continue to gather um, a substantial behavior data. Um, again, and they're eager to try strategies to help. So here is where we we are considering, and I'll let Stefan speak more in detail about this that he has mentioned, is in terms of using and appealing to your transdisciplinary approach. Stefan. Thank you, Denise. I think what's what's very different between a, a multidisciplinary team and transdisciplinary team approach is the transdisciplinary is very uh, specific about having different professional around the table. And, and I always say to all the school boards that I work with is this team should be put together uh, as soon as you know that in your school, you're gonna have a lot of diagnosis you know, with autism, diagnosis with severe behaviors, diagnosis with ADHD. That's the transdisciplinary team is not a crisis team. It's a team with people around that have knowledge with all the necessity that a child would need within the school environment. So you would have the parents 
So that means right from the, the start, the school principal would have a strong communication with the parents. Parents would be part of the team and not invited to receive that information. So the way it works is it's to the first thing that a school principal, vice principal, they should look at their staff and really start thinking of who would be a, a great um, person to be around with specific skills, either in behavior, in pedagogy, with family issues, with cultural issues, and also not neglecting the leadership of the school principal because the school principal are the people that would choose their team. They would meet the first time. They would you know, express the needs within their school. And then based on that, that transdisciplinary team would probably either you know, define roles, ask a specific individual to be part of the team based on needs, and also uh, make sure that they associate uh, the strength of the professional with the profile of the children. So that would be phase one. You can switch, uh, Jenny. Uh, and then in phase two is it, really uh, starting to uh, define a common vision. Okay, so what are we going to do if we have 15 uh, students within the school that are really uh, high risk is what are what's the mission? How are we going to look at it? Who's going to be involved? Uh, what are the first step to take as soon as school starts? The first three weeks are so important in establishing uh, some really good foundation with regards to uh, behaviors and also uh, relationship between the teachers and uh, the students. And then once that is established and once you have a resource teacher part of the team, whoever is there, then you can start defining the goals and really start putting a plan together to prevent crisis, not to react to crisis. And I think this is where we went wrong in, in a lot of environment is we think that, oh, well, I've got an expert in my school, I've got this and I've got that. That's not the way to think about it. If you're going to really switch and they change that paradigm and really start looking at transdisciplinary team approach is you would have a team that can rotate every year based on the needs and the amount of students that are high risk within your school environment. And so that means you would build capacity internally and eventually you don't have to depend on people to, from the outside to always come in. And so phase four is then when you re-meet. I've done it, I've tried it uh, with, with one board and we would meet once a month. And then the only time that the people would be around would be about complex case because there was a lot of stuff started, uh, it didn't work. Uh, so rather than keep doing observation and, and disturbing everything, we would rethink and, and revamp and adapt based on uh, the appropriate need at that point. Thank you, Stefan. And this uh, template or tool that we have is from webinar two. So if you are able to see from your association website, um, you are able to access the, uh, the tool there as well. Okay. Um, so now if we think about the annual, the alternative program page for the IEP to sort of help support, because when we talk about behaviors and uh, there is a reason for behaviors to occur, we're trying to understand, well, how do we plan and ensure that the student is, that there is tools set up or we use the IEP as a, as a, as a goal or as a program goal to support a student. So in this particular case, so think back into to webinar one in the IEP, consider the student's program and how can the IEP be used? So the following here, is this an example of what an alternative program page three might look like uh, for this particular case? So keep in mind, it's, it's always important to establish um, the student's current level of assessment as we look to ensure that the annual program goals meet, meet that needs as well. So in this area, the blue area are really teaching strategies that are highlighted. And these are all ABA uh, teaching strategies, right? Positive reinforcement, visuals, a, a, a toolkit, prompting and fading, video modeling, priming. These are things that we could use to support this particular student. So we've got the learning expectation, you've got your teaching strategies, and your assessment methods as well. In, in thinking about um, 
uh, Karen, and, uh, Karen and Safe Schools document. So this resource is available to all as well. And I think it was also mentioned uh, by Colin to assist staff uh, and assist the students, uh, some students, <laughs> uh, the school leaders to promote and support caring and safe school culture. So it's really a useful tool and documentation uh, for schools and it's K to 12 document. Um, okay. In a light with that is we also ensure and do encourage um, equity, right? Conditions, um, condition or state of fair, inclusive, respectful environment um, for students, um, inclusive education where students see themselves. And in, along with being inclusive is where we are also encouraging our, what, what are their, what systems do you have in place at your school that may be as, as barriers for our students? And of course, we always need to make sure that the uh, lived experiences, culturally relevant, responsive pedagogy is being um, embedded in our students' um, learning environment resources um, that we are using to, to teach our students. Another document that is often used as well that we refer to and is a good guide is the progressive discipline um, document again was which was mentioned the resource is intended to help again reviewing current student discipline practices at your school identify what they are does anything need to be revamped revised or edited or revisited is there a team approach at the school level to deal with that because discipline is not just the you know the responsibility of one person but as collectively the school culture what what is our practice Practice around discipline. How how is student voice um, being heard in that as well too? Um, so those are things that we also want to uh, ensure as well. Um, and we keep in mind for our students with special education needs, in particular in this webinar, talking about students with autism, we know we have to we have to understand their behaviors. You have to understand the student for whom they are, um, but but certainly. Um, know that whenever we're talking about discipline, we're talking about progressive discipline, we're talking about intervention, being proactive, and looking for ways to set up the environment so that students can be uh, successful. Um, progressive discipline, again, defined as you see um, in there, this is just more information that is available from the document um, on a continuum, and you look at uh, appropriate and inappropriate behaviors that are that students are dispelling right and again identifying those behaviors, and I think as um, Stefan had mentioned is why the behaviors are happening, if we understand that the students are, are you know, expressing their way of form of communication, then we really need to make sure that we find a way to encourage um, students, you know, appropriate behavior by actually teaching some explicit skills. Okay. And of course, this in, re in relation to PPM 119, which uh, Colin, uh, one of our gentlemen did mention earlier, and that's something for us to think about uh, in terms of your data at your schools. Now, some other tools that are available, um, such as functional behavior assessments. Now, you, there are formal ones that's done by um, psychologists and there's informal one um, as well. And there is behavior uh, support plan. Um, of course, uh, we've mentioned, or I think um, as Stefan mentioned um, antecedent, we talked about ABC data chart. Uh, and in this particular case, we have data. So now we have to analyze the data and really intentionally um, put something in place to address those behavior, of, let's say over a three week period and really uh, monitor and support that plan over um, a period of time. We know that safety plans are often time used and I would say more so the safety plan is a that crisis prevention um, mod response to, um, you know, injury to self and or others. Uh, you've got the IEP to use as programming to sort of help out with that, with programming to address those behaviors. So is there a common space in the classroom? Is there a toolkit that the student can use to refer to when they're, when perhaps behaviors are escalated? Of course, there's observations can be done by various people. And of course, um, so in this particular case, Autism Speaks provides an aggressive and challenging behavior toolkit that uh, is available for educators as well to um, peruse. I think um, with that, that was our last slide. I don't know if there's any questions or any comments. Uh, 
Uh, we're not seeing any questions that haven't been uh, addressed, Janine, at this point. Uh, your comments throughout the webinar have been wonderful, though. And again, you have that opportunity to bring forward any questions with Janine and Stefan on the line. Uh, you are reminded that you will receive a follow-up email tomorrow with a package of resources that will um, give you access to what you've seen today as well to an online survey uh, for your feedback. This was the third of this year's webinars. And of course, we'll start planning for next year before too long at all. Janine, back to you. Great. Um, thank you very much for participating in our webinars. Like we say, um, for our students with special education needs, there are, you know, we do have to consider what the needs are. And I certainly would love to have your feedback in the series that we have provided here for you for this year too. So on the should have popped up is um, there's the webinar, end of webinar poll. So please do take some time to complete that for us. And uh, Janine, we have had a couple of questions pop up now. One is, and I think it's to either of you, how do we respond to parents of other students in the classroom who may be affected by the behavior of a student with autism? So again, you know, we do have, um, as administrators, same, same way that you would have dealt, you would deal with it if you had other concerns. So you do want to reassure parents that obviously the situation is being dealt with. And this is where you then rely on your interdisciplinary team to really put a plan in place to support the students. Um, I think we do have to, that culture, build in that cultural of understanding and ensuring that everyone understands what like the, the classroom environment and in, um, understand the classroom environment, the structure of which is in place and that there is a process. And that of course, the safety of everyone is, in, you know, as a paramount for all staff um, and students within the school. So you would like to obviously address that with the parent and then follow up what is being done in, in terms of the classroom and the support that's being provided for the students and perhaps others out there as well through your school support teams as well. Stefan, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think, uh... Uh, it, that's a great question. I think if you take, like I said, the transdisciplinary approach, any parent that their child would be, you know, afraid or a uh, victim of, of uh, some form of uh, aggressive behaviors, they, these parents should also have an avenue where they can communicate. So if they would have an opportunity, if you have a transdisciplinary team within your school, the parents that are also victim because their child is afraid should could talk with that team and that team would either set up a meeting with both families and then express or based on what that family said, then they would adapt uh, the, any form of intervention and uh, also communicate with the parents of the child and really explain the impact, the cause and effect of the behaviors, not just on their child, but also on the other kids within uh, that classroom. So I think that's the beauty of team. Uh, transdisciplinary team is you anticipate that that's going to happen and I think we need to stop thinking that maybe we'll have a nice year you need to anticipate in advance that situation will happen is to have a forum a way to deal with that and so if you have a good transdisciplinary team you can really uh, reassure all families within the school. Uh, and then Janine and Stefan, we had someone just want to circle back to the PPM that came out, I think it was uh, early last summer, around the changes to suspensions and primary aged students. Does anyone have a number for that PPM at all? Uh, PPM 119, I believe. Judith, I know that. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's 119. Yep, PPM 119. Uh, and it came out in, I think, June 2000, I believe. So any students um, kindergarten to grade uh, grade three in terms of suspension. So you've got to consider mitigating factors and other, um, you know, progressive discipline that's that is in the that's in the school, as well as along with that, I believe that you know they do have. I think um, at the time, any student that had the suspension could, I know within our board, could have that ex um, expunged from the records. Thank you. Uh, someone has asked around the role of trustees and how to keep them informed. And I would suggest that this is a piece that you definitely want to speak and work with your superintendent 
because mm -hmm. every situation, every school, every school board will likely have a different way of managing all of that. But you're you're very wise to consider the the play how this plays out for trustees within your community. So uh, people are also asking about the first two webinars held this year, and I would suggest that you go to your own association website and if you simply search autism or ASD webinars, chances are you'll be able to find the page right away. I know that both CPCO and OPC, we posted those links in, um, in the chat today. And for anybody from CPCO in your follow-up email tomorrow, you'll also have a link to where everything from last year and this year is posted and you can access everything. Uh, just looking through to the bottom here uh, with respect to other questions, and it takes a look. I think it looks like that we've covered everything. And uh, we do have two more minutes, but uh, Janine and Stefan and Judith as well, we really want to thank you for everything that was shared, not just today, but over all three webinars this year and last. The feedback from our associates and members has been incredibly strong and complementary to your skill and your leadership. It's a pleasure to work with you uh, and teaming with you with respect to building all of this learning. Last words, Janine, I'll leave to you. Well, no, thank you all. It's been a team effort. I know certainly we all support each other. And um, as was mentioned, please do check out the first two webinars if you haven't had an opportunity to do so. And likewise, we will look to next year and based on your feedback to see what we can also provide, continue to provide for it and support in our students with autism. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again to everyone. Feel free to reach out to Nadine if you're from OPC or myself if you're from CPCO. We are always here to serve your learning needs and support you in your leadership. We look forward to seeing you next year and we look forward to getting feedback from um, both the website materials and the survey that's coming to you. Your voice is extremely important. Enjoy the rest of the day. Enjoy the sunshine. Hopefully it's coming to your corner in Ontario and look forward, please, to our upcoming April, March break. Take care, everybody. Thank you.